Hi, it's Rob Moore here, and welcome to the module five, scaling up of my six month online business coaching program. We are live to the members of the online business coaching program and I'm doing a little bit of a live and giving you a taster of some content regarding scaling up your business. Uh, so uh, the six month business coaching program, the six main modules of building, sustaining and scaling any business, maybe even selling it, um, well, month one or module one is the startup phase. Module two was all about sales and generating sales. Module three was all about staffing and systems. Module four was all about survival, because sometimes you have to go through survival times in business. Uh, module five this month is about scaling. And then module six will be sustainability through uh, maybe selling up or maybe going through sort of the more mature stage of your business. Um, we're going to focus on the fifth module today, which is scaling up. Let me just get comfortable. There's a right wedge in the, in, in the desk here. That's much better. Um, and then we have actions and accountability for those of you that watch the um, live stream or are actually on the uh, six month coaching program. All right, then. Um, so the growth of a business um, brings challenges uh, and it also brings great opportunity. I would say the most important elements of scaling your business would be going from local to national to global. That's point one. So if you have a local business, that's great. Um, but if you can make it more, go more national, that might be a franchise model. That might be opening offices in different locations. Don't do that too fast. That might be setting up an online element. We do live streams now globally. I have listeners to my podcast globally. We'll be running events in six different countries around the world this year. So I've resisted kind of really pushing for glo global growth from our uh, events perspective, just because I had kids and wanted to spend a lot of time with them. We, we had a good foothold in the UK. We built a business to sort of nearly 20 million pounds, but now it's time to go global. Now, when we first started uh, buying property and progressive property in 2006 stroke seven, we were just uh, local, you know, buying properties in Peterborough. So if you can make your business model scalable from local to national to global through online, through systems, uh, through opening different offices or franchises or partnerships or collaborations, that's obviously going to dramatically help your scalability. One warning, don't do it too fast. If you do it too fast, all the profit that you make in the one location or with the one product might get eroded trying to finance the other ones. OK, um, the next then would be what I call the elegant business model. Uh, so the elegant business model is where you have a staircase of products and services. Now, the way I built my business model is I will go lots of free content at the top and then um, lots of very low paid content like books, audio books, audio programs, you know, monthly membership subscriptions, which are very low priced to kind of at the, at the, the Netflix model or, or, or close to that. Uh, and, and you might be able to get hundreds of hours worth of content for me at that free and that very low cost level. That means you can build trust, rapport, you can connect, you can get to know, like and trust. You, um, you, know, you feel like um, th there's not that element of I don't know who this person is. I don't know much about their business model. I don't know much about their practices. I don't know how long they've been going because all of that gets answered. Uh, and then I might invite you to an event which costs a little bit more. Um, and then there's a sales environment where you can buy products and services of mine. And then when you've bought various events, which might be sort of 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, 3,000, you've already got lots of built up goodwill. So that's, there's low friction there. And then after the course elements, then there may be the mastermind elements, the ongoing accountability and support. Uh, and then once you've had the accountability and support, there might be um, uh, lifetime or extended renewal offers or retreats. And then once you've gone all the way down one vertical with the elegant business model, then you might say, hey, you know, I've made a lot of money in property through Progressive. I'm very happy. And then you might decide you want to train with us on our podcast vertical or um, on our public speaking vertical or on our e-commerce vertical. So the non-elegant business model is people throwing products and services at you straight away, quite high ticket with no trust and lots of friction. The elegant business model is taking them on a journey. Now, through my um, companies, and I have no um, uh, desire to hide this, I'm a very open book, there are probably about £200,000 worth of products. I mean, you wouldn't um, begrudge Ferrari selling um, add-ons or upgrades or, or bringing out other cars or experiences. They do luggage, they do clothing and various other uh, brand product endorsements. 
Um, so, you know, if your company has multiple products and has a staircase of them, one after the other, after the other, after the other, as opposed to all at once in your face, then that's an elegant business model. Could we just turn this um, screen off, do you think? Because it's all sort of, um, it's distracting me behind. Thank you. Uh, right, so how can, if you've got products, how can you create services around those products? You know, if you sell um, widgets and items, could you have consultancy training and development around those products and services? Once people have bought a product of yours or they've bought all your products, could, create, could you create another product, an add-on product? You know, like cars often make more money out of the servicing than they do the cars themselves. Okay, next then is cash obviously fuels growth. You may be looking to raise venture capital. You know, you may be reinvesting retained earnings, retained profits into growing the business. Now, a lot of small businesses I see, they're not really spending money on marketing and they wear it like a badge of honor. You know, they've got these epaulets and these badges all over themselves, which say, I do no marketing, I spend no money, I just get word of mouth referrals. You know, and, and, and like that's a great thing. When in reality, if you're not spending today, then you're probably not getting leads and business tomorrow. Of course, you shouldn't be spending frivolously. You should be testing, measuring and tracking absolutely all your spend. You cannot um, master what you do not measure. Um, but that being said, um, I would suggest that many of you should start to have a test budget. So you may decide, I can invest £1,000 a month today in marketing. Um, and, and even if I didn't get much of a return, I know that's an investment in working out what works. So yeah, in our budget for marketing, we have about 20% of the spend is for new things like Spotify ads, Amazon ads, um, and areas where we're testing, where we know we're not going to be great at first and we're probably going to not get a massive return because we're in the learning phase before the earning phase. Um, but if we don't spend that 20%, then we don't in the future have the 80% to spend on the proven ad, ad strategies like Facebook ads or, or CPA lead gen or you know, wherever we do our marketing. So make sure that you're reinvesting some of your profits. Mark and I tend to draw about half of our profits and leave half of the profits retained um, for reinvesting in marketing, for staffing. We built a, a, a live stream studio here. I'll just show you around if you're on the live. Um, so we're streaming this at the moment to the... Um, the members of the online program. So, you know, we reinvested significant profits in continuing to grow our business. Uh, but we, don't, we do that with retained earnings, not without profit. Uh, and um, we do it progressively rather than aggressively. I think if you raise money and you raise capital, that's fine, but be careful because a lot of people, when they raise capital, they don't really see it as their own. They didn't hard earn and save it. So they tend to be more frivolous with the way that they spend it. And I would warn you against that. Um, you cannot master what you do not measure. So when you use cash to fuel growth, then um, make sure you're measuring it all. But cash is not the only thing that fuels growth. Uh, let me see if I can just move out of the way so you can see the slides there. There you go. Um, creativity fuels growth. Multiple streams of leads fuels growth. Collaborations fuels growth. Joint ventures fuels growth. Innovation fuels growth. Leveraging free online and social media fuels growth. So whilst cash does fuel growth, don't just rely on cash, rely on innovation, creativity, um, low cost and, and free lead gen, etc. Okay, next thing, if you want to grow your business, if you want to scale up, then it's about marketing, marketing, marketing. Uh, and uh, if you imagine a shop, you could have a brilliant salesperson in the shop. I um, got uh, my wedding suit from Tom Ford and I ended up coming out with a three piece uh, wedding suit rather than a two, uh, a pair of shoes, two shirts, two ties, Spare this, spare that, because obviously I needed it, because the salesman was really good. But if I hadn't walked into the shop, he couldn't have done his magic. So the reality is marketing is getting people in the shop. Uh, and sales is once they're in the shop selling them their products and services. So are you do, do you have multiple streams of leads? Are you, you doing multimedia marketing? Um, or are you just relying on the old school or the word of mouth or just one way that works really well for you? Now, when you have one way that works really well for you, you can kind of get a bit complacent or lazy or comfortable. Hey, well, I don't really need to do many of this, much of this digital stuff because I've got these two ways of marketing that work really well. I run this little um, newspaper ad and it works really well and I get word of mouth referrals. But what if they dry up? I remember a very famous American marketer who um, taught me uh, that it's better to have... At the, at the time, I'd bought about 20 properties all from estate agents and I was quite proud of myself. You know, I was peacocking somewhat, look at me. Uh, and he said, well, that's great, Rob, but I think it's better to get 20 properties from 20 different lead sources, you know, leafleting, postcasting, postcarding, newspaper ads, um, etc. 
um, billboarding. And I was like, well, why would you bother with all that when you can get more from agents? And he said, well, what if estate agents start to charge the buyer as well as the seller a fee? You know, what if they charge you 2% of the property to buy as well as the seller? Then, you know, your business is over. And whilst that's not likely, he was right. So there could be some regulation change. You know, there's been the tenant uh, fee ban, hasn't there, in letting agencies. And um, so if you get all of your leads from one source and that source dries or there's a recession or Brexit or some kind of regulation or, you know, legal issue, then you don't have more sources of leads. So multiple sources of leads is really important. There you go. That's the next slide. Multiple sources of leads. Multiple sources of leads will generate multiple sources of income. One source of lead will, source, will generate one source of income. Now you have to balance because if you're going like, yeah, Rob, all right, then I'm going to do 58 lead sources. Then obviously you're overwhelmed, you're thin, you're a bit distracted and stressed. You can't go deep on any one of them. But of course, if you only have one stream of income or one lead source, that could dry up. So what I tend to do is focus on 170% of my time, make, make that work, test, measure, tweak, repeat, test, measure, tweak, repeat. Um, then once that's worked well for an amount of time, systemize it, maybe hire a staff member to do it or set up systems and automation on it. And then in the background, 20% of my time, I'm on this newer lead source. And then in the background, 10% of my time, I'm testing some sort of out there one, like we are on Spotify ads at the moment. Uh, and then once I've systemized the 70, the 20 can become the new 70. Uh, the 10 could become the new 20 and then I can test another one. That might be Amazon ads. And, and you just like a conveyor belt, a sausage machine, 70% of my time, test, tweak, review, repeat, um, and then systemize that and bring a new income stream in or a new lead source in, a new income stream, a new lead source in. And then before you know it, you have 10, 20, 30 uh, uh, streams of leads and streams of income. All right, back of house breakage. The faster you grow, the more breakage there will be. Uh, and that is just the way business works. Uh, now, of course, you can plan for this by systemizing in advance and hiring up in advance and, you know, uh, planning and preparing before you launch. But in, no matter how well planned you are, I think it was Mike Tyson said, you can, you can have a, a game plan until you get punched in the face. I probably butchered his quote, but you know what I mean. So uh, it's inevitable that will be breakage. The, the faster your growth, the, the, the more likely there is the breakage, the resistance, the legal, the reputational, the staffing issues, the sort of the admin issues, the IT issues, the people issues. So you've just got to plan that in advance as best you can without procrastinating and then start to grow and maybe grow slowly at first and build up some momentum uh, and then hopefully have the minimum amount of breakage. But if you know that back of house breakage is inevitable now, you can plan for it as much as you can. And then when things do break, you don't t throw your toys out of your pram and have a meltdown and you just fix the problems as you go. Uh, and, you know, it's just good to be honest about that, to know that that's inevitable. And by the way, if you have no breakage, you're, you're not growing or scaling up your business quick enough. Rolling recruitment. So as you scale up, sometimes you can't hire quick enough. And if you scale up and you generate loads of business and you've got loads of admin and loads of customer support and loads of delivery on all these products and services you've sold, uh, but you haven't scaled up your staff accordingly, then what's going to happen is you're going to sell these great products and services and you're not going to deliver them. And then there's going to be refunds and breakage. You know, like I said, the faster the growth, that is inevitable. You know, we're not perfect. Um, we set up a, a brand new social media agency. Uh, we've got maybe 12 um, beta clients and 11 of them love us and one of them we let down a bit because our communication was you know, not as good as it could have been. I'm going to win a round. She's awesome and I know that I can fix that. Um, but, you know, we, we just probably, um, we just let one person down because there was some breakage. This happens, you know, I'd love to say we're perfect and there's never any breakage. But, you know, when you're a 20 million pound or nearly 20 million pound of your business, this is going to happen. Um, but if you scale up in advance of in your staff and your systems, so you, you build systems for the next round of growth, you um, are on a rolling recruitment policy at Progressive Property, new business managers, um, you know, and people who book people onto our events, we're always recruiting for them. I'm always recruiting for social media people, you know, so like, um, because if I start recruiting when I need them, it might take three to six months to find the right person. Uh, so, you know, you're going to be three to six months too late. Now, of course, the challenge of rolling recruitment is you might hire someone a bit before you can afford it or you think you're ready, but at least then they have time to be trained and learn the systems and learn the culture of the business. And you've got to balance the cost with the upside. Um, I know one old school business owner who's very successful and he says, you know what, Rob, don't hire anyone until things start to break and everything breaks because then you know that you've not got any wastage, but you've got breakage. So you're either going to have wastage or breakage one way or the other.
um, I like to have a rolling recruitment policy for the important roles so that um, when we find the right price person they're in, rather than having to wait six, three, six, nine months once you made the decision. And remember, the more you scale up, the more demand and need for staffing and systems you're going to have. It's not going to be the same as it is today. Um, I don't know what multimedia is. I think I was being a bit clever there. Multimedia. So multimedia is, um, you know, broadcasting yourself on Facebook, doing, using live streams on YouTube, leveraging Instagram, doing CPA, JVs, uh, doing um, Amazon ads, Spotify ads, Facebook ads, Google ads, Bing ads, having a referral and ambassador program. Um, you know, getting out there on media, maybe trying to do some PR and, and you know, writing articles on Medium and um, writing articles on LinkedIn. There's so much media out there. And I know on the one hand that could be quite overwhelming because there's so much media out there. But it's also decentralised because basically BBC, Sky, Condé Nast, all these big media empires used to own all media and you had no chance for advertising, marketing or disruption. And now media's all been broken up. I mean, if you think about um, TV now, you've got Netflix, you've got Apple TV, you've got Sky, you've got Amazon Prime. So even uh, like TV media is breaking up. I mean, it had broken up a lot for, earlier in the, in the US, but the stuff in the US tends to happen here first and then there first and then come over to here. So make sure you are multimedia, not just single media. Um, and of course, you can uh, ultimately become an agency one day. If you get great at leveraging certain media like Facebook, like Twitter, like LinkedIn, like YouTube, um, like podcasts. We have a podcast agency that has nearly 100 clients. I think it's 90 something. We have a social media agency that's in its um, fledgling year, which we're beta testing at the moment. Uh, we are now a media agency as much as we are a property or a business training company. And that's the future. Digital marketing is the future. People are not going to stop doing social media. They're not going to stop going online. The internet is only 20 years old. Social media is probably only 12, 15 years old. So, you know, there's a massive growth. If you think of steel, rail, telecommunications, air travel, that's like that. They're all over 100 years old. So it's a very young, um, immature business, which has got lots of growth, which should be exciting for you. OK, next then we have is partnerships, collaborations and joint ventures. So a way to scale up beyond what you're already doing is to do collaborations. So there's brand co collaborations. Porsche, uh, Porsche do brand collaborations with Adidas for trainers. And they um, uh, like there's lots of collaborations with fashion designers and trainers. I think um, Y3 do them with uh, a brand. Um, like if you think about Bang & Olufsen, now Meridian, Bose, they do collaborations with car manufacturers and put their um, audio equipment in. Um, Name have now started doing that. Burmester do that um, in my Porsche. So that's collaborations which, which benefit both companies. A good association on your brand level. Bose are going to have sold hundreds of thousands of more products with all of their um, audio equipment in um, Porsches and Mercedes, etc. So the brand, brand associations and collaborations are great. Joint ventures where you partner up with a company. Like um, I remember when, was it MBNA? But it was certainly a, a, a credit card company that Virgin uh, partnered up with and, and made it Virgin Money. Virgin are all about collaborations and partnerships. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of scope for finding a, a good brand you'd like to align with and associate with. And, and, and basically one plus one equals three, you get this. Um, leveraged ef effect. Um, someone could promote your products and services and you could promote their products and services if there's an alignment and a fit, for example. That will accelerate your growth. Affiliates. Have an affiliate and an ambassador program. So an affiliate program is where someone can earn 10, 20, maybe more percent uh, of earnings of your products and services, referring them to others. An ambassador program is like an affiliate program, but it's a little bit more involved. It's a little bit more personal. It's not just like sharing links online and then it being tracked back to get sales. It's more about creating a, 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 a micro niche community of people who, you know, will really uh, support your brand and are ambassadors of your brand. If you think of all the golfers who are ambassadors for Odomar's P Gay brand, um, and you'll get a sort of a, a long term benefit of having ambassadors who are champions of your brand. Thank you very much, Lorraine. Do a little bit of brand association here. Yeah, Costa, you should be paying me. I, sh I should own 10% shares in Costa, honestly. Um, if you're watching, Mr. Costa, Whitbread. Oh, no, Whit did they sell? I think Whitbread might have sold 
recently. Anyway, um, building multiple assets. So a book is an asset, a property is an asset. Your training facility or your offices that you own is an asset. Your web presence is an asset. Your domains are an asset. Your Facebook page is an asset. Your blogs are an asset. So building up these multiple, especially online in the new world, assets means you have multiple streams of leads, multiple streams of income, recurring income. I sell pretty much now 200,000 books a year, um, which is, I, for, you know, for me, I'm not like a massive celebrity. I'm really pleased with that number. Obviously, we all want a bit more, don't we? Um, but yeah, you know, I've, I've probably not, i probably bust through the million pound, million um, sales of books now, give or take. I actually don't know for sure, but if I'm selling 200,000 a year, it must be close because I've been selling books since 2008. So they're all assets that produce recurring income and then you put them on audio and then you have those assets that are recurring income. Then you have all the podcasts. Now, I don't sell ads, but if you sold ads, then you've got recurring income from those. So building up multiple assets means that you have leveraged passive income, recurring income. Now, of course, you have to set to forget um, and I have spent time building these assets, but you know I like spending time building assets because it's better than exchanging your time for non-assets um, or just you know an hourly rate. And Neil said he thinks Coca-Cola bought Costa. Uh, maybe right. Um, if you're watching, Mr. Coca-Cola. Okay. Um, so all of these multiple streams of leads, uh, multimedia business channels, multiple assets, affiliates, ambassadors, partnerships, collaborations, joint ventures. They all create vast trickle-down revenue. Now, I have no problem selling and nor should you. If you believe in your products and services, you should have no problem selling it. Do not be a wimp. But, you know, if you get too aggressive with the selling, then there's an attrition of that. There's a cost because some people don't like that. So if you can have these multiple sources of leads and uh, assets and media all generating trickle-down revenue that goes all the way down your elegant business model, then you win and you win big and you scale big and you have massive leverage and you have a much better reach and more depth of reach than your competitors. Okay, so um, direct response and brand marketing. So direct response is uh, buy my stuff, click this link, subscribe to this, pay for this. Uh, whereas brand marketing is, hey, look at my logo and my visuals, 10,000 songs in your pocket, etc. So brand is more visual repetition to create mind space. When you think of a fizzy drink, maybe you think of Coca-Cola. And if you don't, you, you think of Fanta, they're probably owned by Coca-Cola. Um, so that's the brand is the mind space, the awareness, the, the recall in your mind when they think of a product and service, hopefully you. But, you know, if you go spending loads of money on that, unless you're a massive corporate, that can be um, a waste of money or at least you can't track the return. Whereas direct response, you can track the return. So as you grow and build, you're going to probably be better in the early stages pumping money and time into direct response advertising so you can um, track and measure uh, and get a return on your investment. And then as you grow and you've got 20% budget um, that can be as test budget, you could start uh, more brand type marketing and getting your, your visuals and your logos and your taglines and your culture out there um, just to sort of try and program people's minds. All right, wow, boom. So thanks for tuning into the live. Um, remember, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. I'm very grateful for you tuning in. I'm going to carry on. I'm going to do a and a but I'm actually going to do it on the um, live course itself. So thanks for tuning in on the Facebook feed. See you soon.